Hiya folks, Carl James here from Lecture Media Madness, joining me for another episode of Strange Tales. Today I want to talk a little bit about Ridley Scott and his film Prometheus, and connect the film to that bugaboo of esoteric knowledge research known as Saturn worship. Now the power and role of Saturn in science fiction dates back to the very earliest points of the genre, and to a writer whom some consider to be one of the earliest authors of the now familiar notion of science fiction, namely Mary Shelley and Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus. The story was published first in 1818, with Shelley's name appearing on the second edition in 1823. Mary Shelley was the second wife of the English poet Percy Shelley. Almost parallel to Frankenstein, Percy Shelley wrote perhaps his greatest work known as Prometheus Unbound. Note the synchronicity here in the naming of Prometheus Unbound and Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, and of course I'll come to Prometheus the film from Ridley Scott in a moment. So that work was first published in 1820 and Mary Shelley provided much input into Prometheus Unbound. And although Percy's death was in 1822 and stalled the publication for several years, she was able to publish her own version of the text in 1839. And the play centres on the torments of the Greek mythological figure Prometheus. In Act 2, Scene 2.4, The Cave of Demogorgon, Asia and Panthea, Percy Shelley speaks of the Purple Knight and the Rainbow Winged steals. And these are concepts, the Purple Dawn, the Rainbow Bridge, that kind of thing. They are readily familiar to those people who look into esoteric aspects of Saturn worship. So Percy Shelley asked via the character Asia, and who made terror, madness, crime, remorse, which from the links of the great chain of things to every thought within the mind of man, sway and drag heavily, and each one reels under the load towards the pit of death. Asia continues, who reigns? There was the heaven and earth at first, and light and love, then Saturn, from whose throne time fell, an envious shadow, such the state of the earth's primal spirits beneath his sway. Ridley Scott was a huge fan of Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, and talked about the work in a number of interviews over the years. What I find most interesting about this is that there are many, many nods to transhumanism in the films of Ridley Scott. It is in Prometheus, it's also in Alien, it's in Blade Runner. He was also an executive producer on the television series Raised by Wolves, which also alludes to transhumanism and things like that. And it's known that Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus, is a thinly veiled analysis of the kind of science that would eventually become known as transhumanism. Ridley Scott has actually admitted that the prequel to Alien, Prometheus, was partly named, amongst other things, in honour of Shelley's work. And in the documentary series Prophets of Science Fiction, Scott discussed that perception of the novel's themes. He said, Frankenstein's thesis started off as well-meaning, thinking that actually it would help medically as to be able to create life. It meant that he had to take a body and actually start experimenting on a dead body and try to ignite life into the dead body. If I was a scientist on that road, there's no way I could be stopped. I would definitely continue to do that, but it may lead you into trouble that you can't control, and therefore the whole process of his intention became perverted. It is synonymous with technology gone amok, but the true meaning of the original story is much more complex. Mary Shelley asked, is it really wrong for science to create life? And that's an idea that we get into with Prometheus itself, with the engineer aliens who are seeding planets throughout the galaxy and creating life there in various forms. But that's not the only thing that's raised in the film. There's a fascinating article on the website Vigilant Citizen entitled Prometheus, a movie about alien Nephilim and esoteric enlightenment. It examines the greatest significance of Prometheus and the motif of Prometheus in the film. The article says, in Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan, the primeval race of deities that came before the Olympians. He stole fire from the gods in order to give it to humanity, an act that enabled progress and civilization. For accomplishing the act of bringing fire, a symbol of divine knowledge to humanity, Prometheus became an important figure in the mythology of mystery schools, such as Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism, which are based on the usage of occult knowledge in order to achieve godhood. And there are more themes. If we look at the Blu-ray director's commentary from Prometheus, where Ridley Scott describes the origins of the story, he talks about how the film was inspired by the science fiction classic Quatermass and the Pit. He said, the screenwriter was a very creative man. He was the one who came up with the idea of pre-visitation. I think even before Eric Von Daniken. 
they'd found what they thought was a bomb in World War II lying underneath the subway. And of course it's a spaceship and above it the area is called Hobbs Lane. Hobb is the name for a male witch and Hobbs Lane has been called that since the 16th century because there's always been a strange emanation in this section of what would be countryside, then the little street and so on. It was always thought that the street was haunted. I thought it was a great idea, not that we ever used it, but the fundamental basis was there. I thought it would tie up historic facts with present day repercussions when people think it's a ghost and it's not at all. It's the presence of this thing in the ground that keeps appearing because of what it is. And it's curious when we talk about esoteric belief systems that Scott mentions male witches and hauntings in such a context. And we should note as well that the fictional Hobbs Lane was formerly Hobbs Lane with a B, with a single B, being an antiquated name for the devil. And there's another fascinating little tidbit from that aforementioned commentary. Because in Prometheus, the planet that the ship arrives at is called LV-223. And in the commentary, Scott makes a startling admission that the designation was chosen deliberately as a, quote, very romantic code name. It doesn't elaborate on this idea of a code name any more than that in the commentary, but it's possible that Scott considered that name romantic because it harkened back to this idea of the planet in the original Alien, LV-426 uh, in Alien it was, and that was of course the film that did much to launch Scott's high profile Hollywood career at the time. However, some people might think that I'm reading too much into this, but the numbers that constitute the planet's name do have esoteric value. If we reverse 223, we get 322. Two. Now think about this idea of words and symbols in an occult context, which is something I'll get to in a moment again with this idea of Saturn, Saturn worship and Saturn symbolism. That number 322 is associated with Yale University's Skull and Bone Secret Society, a society that counts amongst others US former presidents George Bush Jr and senior as its members. 322 has numerous other occult and esoteric connotations. It's also relevant in relation to Saturn worship. So I find it curious that Scott refers to LV223 and 322 as it were in the occult reversal as a code name. Interestingly, and more, perhaps even more scary, is that he calls it a romantic codename. And Scott's Prometheus has a number of rather subtly embedded nods to Saturn worship further. Kathy Burns, in the work Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated, described how certain cultures have used the deified Prometheus as a variant name for Saturn. And a number of years ago, I gave a talk at Truth Juice Birmingham entitled The Star Trek Agenda. And in that talk, I brought up a few little bits to do with Saturn worship, specifically in that I was talking to do with the Borg ships, the cube-shaped Borg ships. And when I uploaded the video to YouTube, I was left a comment by this chap called Jason O'Dwyer. He alerted me to another curio about the number 322. He said, if you look at the emblem of the skull and bones, you notice that the two bones form an X. So if you add the X to LV, you get LVX, which is Latin for light. And that, of course, synchronizes the Luciferian aspects of Saturn worship as well. So Prometheus was inspired by Scott's first science fiction film, Alien, another film that actually has some Saturn nuances to it. And most notable of those are the design iconography of the Nostromo starship, the housing chamber of the computer mother. It's almost, as he described it actually, a cathedral of lights, echoing the mother goddess via the principle of the womb and certain Luciferian aspects such as light. The crew's uniform patches also include a ringed planet in the centre, despite the fact that the crew don't know that their voyage would actually take them to a ringed planet. In that case, it was LV-426. And the ringed planet on the patch is also framed by a prominent rainbow arch or rainbow bridge, another aspect of Saturn worship. Part of the plot of Prometheus addresses the idea of faith and religion. In that case of the film, it was actually Christianity. And that's highlighted in an unusual scene in the film where the ship's captain puts up a Christmas tree. Christmas is a variation of the Roman festival of Saturnalia. And the target planet of the film, LV-223, is a moon in orbit of a giant ring planet that is remarkably similar to the planet Saturn. And in the film, Charlize Theron's character states that LV-223 is located half a billion miles away from every man on Earth. Now, far short of being the possible distance between the Earth and a planet orbiting another star, that measurement of distance would actually place the crew of the starship Prometheus in the film somewhere in the vicinity of Jupiter. Now, Stanley Kubrick's film 2001 A Space Odyssey was a huge influence as well on uh, Ridley Scott, and that film posits 
the initiation of some kind of contact between humanity and an ancient extraterrestrial intelligence somewhere in the vicinity of Jupiter. Now, the plot of Kubrick's film was originally intended to be set on the moon Iapetus around the planet Saturn, which actually may go some way to explaining why LV-223's planet is ringed. There was a reason why Saturn decided to take the Saturn alien elements out of 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's something for a much longer video, a different video for another day. Now, Prometheus is credited as being written by John Spates and Damon Lindelof. And there's some controversy over how much material Lindelof actually contributed to the script and story. But Lindelof has claimed that half a billion miles away from every man on Earth line was his contribution to the script. And in a 2012 interview with the Wall Street Journal, he said, I was involved in the movie just looking at tiny little effects, naming planets and star systems. You have to be responsible. Charlize Theron has a line in the film where she says, I wouldn't be a half billion miles away from every man on Earth if I wanted to get laid. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, well-known astrophysicist, came, came out and said, this would put her somewhere in the neighbourhood of Saturn, when they are much, much further out. I chose not to say anything because the line was intentional. It had been dinged before we even shot it, but we stuck by it for reasons I don't feel like discussing. Now that final remark is rather cryptic, but if you know a little bit more about Damon Lindelof, which I will get to in a moment, you'll understand why he may well have put that in there. A number of sources claim that Ridley Scott made the overall decision to keep the line in the film. Now the mainstream narrative on this, that there was some animosity during the production of the film and the involvement of Lindelof in the film has actually been downplayed. And some people have suggested that he intentionally avoided discussing that aspect so as to not rock the proverbial boat, as it were. But I would suggest that Lindelof didn't want to suggest that or justify the inclusion of the line because it has deeper significance. And admitting that would reveal the kind of arcane knowledge that Lindelof actually has. Now, Damon Lindelof was, and to some degree still is, a notable connected member of what I call the JJ Brigade. Uh, this group of fellow writers, producers and directors, the likes of Carlton Cruz, uh, the aforementioned J.J. Abrams. And the J.J. Brigade was a guiding force behind Disney ABC sci-fi fantasy series Lost. I could get into that at great depth here, but I will just say that there are multiple allusions to Saturn belief systems and iconography throughout Lost, such as the purple dawn hue that fills the sky in the two-part story, Live Together, Die Alone. We've got this idea of the island being a, basically an electromagnetic phenomenon that ties into Saturn worship. I'll come to that in a moment. We have the crocodile-headed statue of Tauret that guards the shores of the island. The statue holds the Egyptian Ankh, the symbol of life and death in both hands. Uh, the crocodile in Egy Egypt, being a prototype for mythological dragons and that's all well known in relation to Sebek and to Saturn as the drag the dragon of life there's many many more examples in Lost I hope to get into that in another video at a later point but let's get back to Damon Lindelof and his exposure to these esoteric belief systems so Damon Lindelof was a co-creator multiple episode writer and showrunner of Lost between 2004 and 2010 and a long-standing friend of his was this chap called Robert Goodman and he has a blog where he's documented a huge amount of information about Lindelof that sheds quite a bit of light on his knowledge of Saturnian concepts uh, Goodman attended a group that studied, amongst other things, the teachings of Immanuel Velikovsky. And in that regard, the group would have been very well versed in the notions of catastrophism, the golden age of Saturn, and that sort of thing. And one such member of that group was Charles Raspell, who espoused the concepts very much in line with those of Velikovsky. And Robert Goodman recalled, Charles Raspell took a course on the subject given by Clark Welton at the New York School for Social Research in New York in 1979, just after Velikovsky's death. At the end of that course, Charlie and Dominic Carlucci formed a study group initially from attendees at that course. I'm informed about Charlie in part by David Lindelof, that's actually Damon Lindelof's father, an original and continuing member of the group. The study group continued to meet approximately weekly for over 20 years, although its membership changed and interest became more diffuse. Charlie also became interested in the methods of Saturn theorists, explaining recurrent th motifs in art in terms of things people saw in the sky, although he rejected the idea that the planets were aligned saturnally. Charlie differed from other theorists in their ascribing planetary catastrophes to close encounters between Earth and other massive bodies, Venus, Mars, Meteors or Asteroids, and thought it more likely that orbital anomalies and other 
other strange sights in the sky were caused by and hence correlated with general EM disturbances in the solar system. For those people who aren't familiar with that, this idea of the electric universe. So Robert Goodman has documented Damon Lindelof's awareness of the subjects studied by his father and ruminated about their inclusion in the TV show Lost. He said that Damon Lindelof's father was very interested in the ideas of Manuel Velikovsky and attended conferences on related catastrophism. Damon didn't seem that interested in the topic, but I wouldn't put it past him to incorporate it into Lost. I would argue that if you look at Lost and you look at the role Damon Lindelof played in that show, because he was basically the executive, the executive producer, co-executive producer, I should say, with Carlton Cruz running Lost for the last several seasons. And if you look at the ideas that are in that show, bearing in mind they both wrote numerous episodes of Lost, I would argue that he did take an interest in the subject. If nothing else, he was very, very aware of it, probably from what his dad had studied. And one of the things that seems to be a big bugbear for a lot of people that watch Lost is how the show ended. A lot of things are answered in it, but there was also a lot of contrivances with the show. There was a lot of things that were very convenient. There were a lot of things that seemed to have been made up at the last minute just to tie up loose ends and things like that. And there was a lot of ideas that were left unanswered in the show. For the mass viewing public, it seems that Lost was a puzzle box. And maybe it was that the puzzle was never meant to be solved. Now, I watched Lost from the beginning to the end. I've always believed that Lost was sizably a, a vast metaphor for all kinds of esoteric subjects. And that the puzzle or mystery of the show, it actually can be solved when you look at what is being metaphorically conveyed in terms of esoteric ideas in the show. And in my opinion, Lost depicts all kinds of stories, themes, beliefs, symbolism. And one of those things is actually quite central to it is the precepts behind Saturn worship. So I wonder if that's one of the, the reasons why Damon Lindelof's involvement with Prometheus was downplayed. I think that Damon Lindelof knows a lot about these subjects. I think that Ridley Scott knows a lot about these subjects. I think there was a lot of things going on in tandem there. I think they were jiving very well with their esoteric ideas. But as with a lot of these subjects, the mundanes, the masses, they're not meant to understand this esoteric knowledge. And to tie up that idea and this video, I want to just touch very briefly on this idea of the puzzle again, because I'm convinced that Lindelof shares many perspectives with his fellow JJ Brigade member, JJ Abrams himself. And Abrams gave a rather odd, at least to the ill-informed viewer, rather odd talk to the agenda associated, as I call them, TED organization in January 2008. And in it, he described the mystery box concept of storytelling, which is the idea of a puzzle that the creator fully comprehends, but it's left to be mused over, perhaps indefinitely, by the increasingly baffled external observer. In this case, it's the viewer. And that sounds very much to me like Damon Lindelof's work with Lost, I think it also applies to the concepts that he probably put into Prometheus, which were also very similar ideas to what Ridley Scott was into. If you look at a show like The Leftovers as well, which talks about this idea of parallel realities, EM phenomenon and things like that, that's another show that's left like a mystery box, as a proverbial mystery box, as it were, that there's things there to be gleaned, but ultimately the mundane viewer, as it were, watching it, they're not really going to get what it's about at the end. There's a lot of questions left there. The cipher to all of this, for anybody who's interested, is to go out there and look into the precepts of esoteric research, look into this idea of Saturn worship, look into where the ideas all came from, the symbolism that's associated with it, the precepts, the ideas, how it's scattered all over uh, pop culture media, particularly science fiction as well. I think there's a lot there that can be understood. And I think if we take the time to study it, there's a lot of questions that we will finally get the answers to. But as always with Strange Tales, I will leave all of this for you to decide. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please like, share, subscribe. I truly, truly appreciate it. If you're interested in my alternative knowledge research, you can check out my books. They're available from Lulu Publishing and Amazon.com, the links to which are in the description for this video. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you again very, very soon. Bye-bye for now.